So when the, the day came to get on the flight and come to Ghana, it was exciting, of course. This is something new. I've never been, at that time, I had never been to the African continent, so this was my first trip. So I was excited and landed. As soon as I landed and went into the airport, uh, this overwhelming feeling came over me of just, wow, this is the place. This is home. This is where I should be. It was so strong and overwhelming. I had never been anywhere and had that feeling. I had been to Europe, of course, South America, um, the Caribbean, but it didn't fit, get, I didn't have that feeling that I had when I came to, to touch my foot on Ghana's land. So, of course, the heat was overwhelming, but I loved it because I always liked tropical weather. And we had a long two-and-a-half-hour ride, two- or three-hour ride from the airport to Cape Coast. And that road is intense. It's much better now. It has been redone totally, but it was like an obstacle course. Potholes, it, it, it reminds me of some of the video driving games where they have holes and slicks. And so it was a very dangerous road from that standpoint. And the, the trip, that made a two-hour trip in a car very wearying. So we made it, and... Uh, it, it was just uh, uh, wonderful to see. It was, it was, it was. It, that was exciting to come and visit and see the sights and see the people and and be excited about meeting new people. And so it was exciting. And um, so I uh, remember that about two weeks into the stay, I had one week left that my soul was like mourning. I didn't want to go back. I really did not want to go back. I was like, wow. Oh, do I have to go back to America? I had never been to a place and felt that way. And it wasn't because it was so modern and had so many facilities. It was not modern at all, to say the least. Because while we were there, the electricity went off several times. Just goes off. No warning. Just bam. Off. You have no warning. You have no idea when it's coming back on. It's just off. And if you're living in a place, of course, I, I shouldn't say if you're living in a place where they have no lights because nobody would have lights at that time. So it would be very dark. And something I noticed during that time, that Africans had a, they could see in the dark almost. See, I had a hard time seeing in the dark. They could see, well, much better than I could. Be passing by somebody and on the road and they know who you are. Oh, hi, how are we doing, Avi Kai? I'm like, <laughs> so I that's found that interesting. interesting. <laughs> and Avikai, yes. did you would yes. you share that literally can hardly see your hand in front of your face when the lights are out there? Yes, it's, it's that dark. If the moon is not out, so I had experiences mm -hmm. when I later on when I moved there, the way I had to walk, and I had to walk, and I would not want to take the, the uh, for some for that particular particular period of time, I didn't have a car, and I didn't have transportation, and maybe I was doing a gig. Those were very hard times. I had to walk a long distance, or maybe the car would only be able to, the, the taxi service or the uh, the public transportation would only go to a certain point, and I didn't have enough money to charter a cab, so I had to walk. So sometimes I would take shortcuts through the woods, and they'd have paths through the woods where everybody would travel, and it was okay in the, when the moon was out, but when the moon wasn't out, oh, my, ooh, that was rough. So, but, so that would be the thing that would happen, and then water would go off, and so you'd see women going with their buckets and pans, going to locations where they may have water. So all those things I saw even on the first trip, and telephone service, of course, was, uh, very spotty. So in order to make a phone call, so the person that I was staying with, they had a phone, but it was only for incoming calls. So fortunately, there was a hotel across the street that could make outgoing calls that way. So halfway through the trip, that 
how I was feeling. So I resolved that I would come back and come to live, that I was going to leave America and come to Donna to live. But so Abikai, board, yes. excuse me, but before you go there, would you please tell the audience about what you shared with me about the 10 minutes run? Okay, that was after I um, had returned back to Africa and was um, living there. So to give you an idea, uh, the phone service had still, they still didn't have cell phones, and there weren't a lot of people that could afford to have a landline. And then I believe there was only a limited allotted that people could have anyway. So you may, if you were able to get one, you had to wait forever. So I was at that time living in Cape Coast, and I had moved from Elmina. Now, when I visited uh, Ghana, I, I said Cape Coast, but actually I was living in Elmina, which was the city right next to it. So they were almost like one city. And so I moved to Cape Coast with a brother who had a, rented a big house, and he had a uh, space available for me to rent from him. So I did that. And he was down a dirt road. It was a nice house. It was a, it was a very nice house. And down the road from us was a guest house. And the guest house had a phone. So what we would do when we had people from the States who needed to call us, our family, and so forth, we would give them that phone number. They were willing to let that happen. And the, and the sister, the young sister that worked there, she was very happy to do that for us. And so, of course, we're from America, and, you know, it's exciting to them to have a person from America to be friendly with. Uh, so that's a big deal for them. So... The person from abroad would call that number, and so she would answer the phone, and then they would say, well, can I speak to, let's say, Abikai? And they, then she would say, okay, will you hold on? No, she wouldn't say hold on. She said, call back 10 minutes time, something like that. So they hang up the phone, and she would run down the dirt road, come down out of breath, like, we have to hurry right now. There's a phone call. They're going to call back. I told them to call back in 10 minutes. So whatever you were doing, you had to just drop it right then and there and put off some shoes and race down the road so you wouldn't miss the call. So sitting in the, uh, in, in the lobby there, waiting, waiting for the phone to ring. The phone rings, and she picks it up, and it's for you. So you, you get on the phone and say, hello. And so there would be a delay. Similar to what we're going through here with the radio show, and that's something that when you see us talking back and forth, that's what we're dealing with, that delay. But so I would say hello. No, they would say hello, and then you hit again, hello, hello. Then I would say hello, and it would be hello. So there's like four hellos went on, and so you're confused a little bit at first, so you're trying to adjust yourself. And how are you? How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. And so sometimes – you're answering something, and the other, per the, the other person is saying something else, and you miss it because of all that confusion. So it was, it, it, was, it was really hilarious how when I look back, and it wasn't funny then, but I look back on it, uh, that, that's what we had to go through just to keep a communication with those back in the States. So and you know, that was, I've, yes. I that says something about the nature of the Ghanaian people also, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Very resilient, very, uh, how can I say? Giving. Uh, yes, and, and, and they're very tolerant, extremely tolerant of a lot of things. And, but there's also a, a, lot of, a degree of passiveness also combined because of what the nation went through. In Ghana, when Nkrumah came on the scene, all of that was, I believe, the Gold Coast. So he asked all the surrounding, all of the Gold Coast and the surrounding countries who wanted to be a part of that first nation. He wanted, and he named it Ghana after the ancient civilization of Ghana, Mali, Shanghai. So that was 
what he was trying to uh, model it after as far as the name. And so the territory that is currently Ghana were those who agreed to, yes, we want to be a part of that. So one part of Ghana on the west, on the eastern front, uh, where the Ewe live, which is bordering, is that Togo, I think it is. And it's the, the people are the Ewe, it's the Ewe tribe, but it's the territory is split right down the middle because one part is part of Ghana, the other part is part of Togo, because they didn't want to be a part of that. But they're the same people there. So, but yes, yeah, the people are resilient. But they're also passive from the standpoint when they, when the nation first began, it was just awesome. When I look at some of Nkrumah's old speeches, uh, when he he just stood on the world stage, he he was definitely a world figure. He was powerful in what he was saying and what he wanted for his country. He was one of the few leaders that we see that were willing to sacrifice themselves and be a servant for the people so that the country could prosper. And he had such wonderful programs. But of course, it did not go what oh it didn't go well over well with the Western society, of course, because here they were depending on Africa's resources for cheap to actually build their society, build their world. So here comes Nkrumah to shatter that, and also he the country was rich. The country had gold, the country had cocoa, but he closed down the gold mines and said that we're not doing that anymore until our youth can be trained and our people can be trained to know how to do it ourselves. And until that, so he would... Had his plan was to send the youth abroad and put them to learn the skills that were necessary to do their own mining and to the and 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 what everything else associated with gold mining. So he had uh, a lot of things like that. He, the Poco though was the main funder of what he was doing. So they're, they're the leading and still the leading producer of cocoa, which produces co- uh, chocolate and so many other things that we use, and so. He had devised a plan of, and, and started it with the silos where they would be storing the cocoa and withhold it until it, and he had a strategy with using the cocoa and selling it so that they could store it when they didn't want to sell it until the market was where they wanted it to be. So this was a, he, he, had, he had a lot of things like that that was going on. And so <laughs> the West thought, and, and because of the fact that Ghana was the center for the revolution movement in Africa, the freedom movement in Africa, he funded the training of uh, armies and so forth in different countries so that they would be prepared for what they needed to as a country to be free. So that didn't go over well with the West, and to make a long story short, he eventually was overthrown. He was actually exiled because he was he was lured by the West or tricked by the West to actually be one of the mediators in uh, some sort of uh, dispute in China, so there was a so they drew him away that way, and then they used uh, the CIA used um, uh, I think I forget the the person's name, the black person from America, to actually start the overthrow. So he could not even return. When there was a flight back, he had to divert, and he went to Guinea. And that's where he lived out the rest of his life. But that was the 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 backdrop of what was to come, because after that, there were military regimes. So people had curfews. The nation had curfews, and it was very harsh on them. They had very little supply. So the mindset of, uh, it, it was it created a mindset because. The little supplies that they would get, people would be in long lines at stores just to get toilet tissue. And then so they had to be, they had to acquiesce to the person who had the supplies in their store or or else they could be cut off. So it it, it created a whole atmosphere of oppression. And many of the artists and musicians that I talked to that were older that had went through that, they left 
because the arts and Nkrumah was a big one for the arts, music, art, dance, theater. He was uh, he found that to be very important, and it is in any society. And they had to run to other countries. They had to go to Nigeria. They had to go to to the Ivory Coast just to be able to work because it was a curfew. So there were no clubs open, no places open, no the, the, the arts weren't able to flourish, and so they stagnated. But it created that kind of atmosphere. So, and I noticed, and I could, I didn't understand it at first that when I went to Ghana, I would go to a store, and a lot of the store owners hadn't come up uh, to the service that we were expecting that we have now and because they were used to not having competition. But when I uh, arrived there in 97 and 98, things were starting to, to pick up, and they had a lot of competition uh, in the marketplace and abundance. But there was some that didn't recognize that if you uh, chase off your customers with the attitude, then you won't make any money. So I remember going into a store, and um, I was looking for bottled water. And I went into this particular store, and I picked up the bottled water, and I I, I saw the price down on the uh, – she had a labeled price on the shelf. And so I went to pay for it. She gave me a different price. I said, ah, but the, the price here says this. She says, ah, oh, it's a store for you? Ah, you want to buy it? Ah, and she had that kind of attitude where, you know, it's my store. I do what I want. If I want to change the price because you are here, I change the price, and you're not going to do anything about it. Not realizing that, hey, I can go to another store and get some water and never come to you again, and you will have lost the customer. So that uh, uh, is why I'm saying the, the passiveness and, and as well as tolerance. They also have the tolerance, and they don't like bloodshed. So they'll argue. I mean, they'll argue. They have fierce arguments. But when it gets to the point of shedding where somebody is going to kill somebody or stab someone with a knife, that part they're very careful with. But, and uh, which is different from a lot of other countries. Not that they don't have it. They do have it, but it's different. Well, Avikai, you were talking about the arts, and what came to my mind was high life. Did you learn to play high life when you were there? I didn't. Uh, I did. I, I didn't learn so much on the guitar. I did it on the bass guitar. But the guitar, I still didn't get that. Uh, it's, 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 High life music is um, different on the guitar. It's a different rhythm and different feel, and it's beautiful. I like it, but um, I never really learned that. But I learned the other African type of music, and when I played with uh, the the bands that I played with, we didn't really emphasize that high life style. We didn't do that because everybody was doing it. So, you know, we did want to do something different. So I didn't really learn high life from the standpoint of from the guitar, but I did learn it on the bass. And then, of course, a lot of high life um, songs. There are English high life songs that I learned that I played, and but I have since not really played them. Uh, but a lot of them are in the Ghanaian languages, you know, Khan, uh, Fanti, the Ga. So each section has their uh, different language, and they, and they they play. And high life is different has gone through different stages. During the time of Nkrumah and that, those early days, High Life was very innovative in that a combined jazz and uh, the music from that we as in the Americas, uh, African Americans have um, developed. And it was just, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful the way they did it. They created their own style with jazz um, solos and that type of thing. Well, were you there when Flight Lieutenant Jerry J. Rollins came to power? Not when he came to power. He was already in power when I, when I came there, and that's when the changes started to take place. Because the country was under military regime, and uh, from what I learned while being there, it is a, that that's a whole nother uh, episode almost as far as the history of what happened. But 
um, Lieutenant uh, well AJ Rollins started out. He attempted a coup, I think, during those uh, military years because the people were just so oppressed, um, and he it, he was caught, so he was put in jail. So in jail, and I don't know if I have the whole story correct. He was there for some time, and before he was time to be executed, I think he was uh, broken. He, he, someone broke him out of jail, and it did another coup, and he got into power. So things start still were rough, and they were starting to get uh, a little better. But the thing that squeezed Ghana's neck was that they needed money, and the coffers uh, were empty, and they didn't have the resources. So there was some kind of a deal made with the IMF and the World Bank, and I think that uh, he had to, you know, do some. Well, I don't know what he say. Some some compromising to get the funding that he needed to get started. But you know how the IMF and World Bank work. So um, try to balance that. So then uh, he actually ruled for some time and brought the country to a certain level of, of uh, where they had not been before. And he really seemed to really care about the people and be passionate about the people, but he was kind of gruff, you know, because he was a military person. And um, so finally, you know, they, the, the democracy uh, thing came in and uh, I think that was a mandate too. So he was actually elected and elected twice, but that was the limit of how he could, uh, how far he could go with that. So when I came, I believe, I don't remember whether it was the second term or the first term. It was in 97, so I'm not sure. So there are 10 years. So I know that I remember a an election while I was there, and he was reelected, so... I know I did come during the first term, but how far into it, I don't know. Okay. So back to when I first arrived and what I, the, the emotions and the feelings that I went through, I finally, we, we did get the land and we're excited about that. And, and we flew back to the States. And of course that was, heavy upon me to return. I couldn't shake it. It just got heavier and heavier. I had to go. So that was the creator's way of letting me know, I want you to go there. You have something to do. So I was planning on making it, you know, still a few years until one day I got a call from my sister. And she said, oh, you know, at that time, I think she had already been, she was married to, her husband at that time. And um, what happened was she was saying how they were planning on going to Ghana. They were going to set up there before the end of the year and that they would be doing business there and coming back and forth. So that really prodded me. It was like, oh, no, she's not going there. And I'm not waiting no either. I'm going. So believe it or not, in it really got me I, I really sped up uh, my preparation, that, and I ended up back in Ghana uh, uh, a year, a year, almost a year to the day, to live. But I had this, I had this song that I want to play, that actually expresses, uh, in, in my opinion, what I felt when I visited Africa, because visiting Africa is like the honeymoon. Living in Africa, the honeymoon is over. So <laughs> I want to <laughs> – and I think you know what I mean. I ain't going, That's why I laughed. Because you did live there. <laughs> so it's a whole different animal. So people say, I want to – oh, I want to go to Africa. I want to go and this and that. And I, I always let them know that, well – Living, visiting there is one thing. It's totally different visiting than living. It's no, 
comparison. So you don't get the idea. And I remember <laughs> one person that I knew who had lived in Africa for many years and lived, came back to the States, an African-American. So he was talking to me, and he says uh, he was just testing me to see whether or not I really had counted the cost of going. So he says he started telling me the scenarios of what happens and how what, what Africans do. And it was totally on point because some of the same things he said happened to me. And I said, well, you know, I, 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 no matter what, I, I just love my people and I'm going to go. So he said, well, then you got the right mindset. <laughs> but little did I know what I would go through. So this song is called Wonderful World. So this is my feeling when I'm visiting Africa. Wonderful. 